Well, hello everyone and uh, welcome to Stantec's Winter City Design Webinar. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Shauna Miller and I'm the Marketing Manager for Community Development based in Calgary, Alberta. I'm going to start us off by covering a few logistical items and then I will introduce you to our speakers. So um, all participants will be on mute for the presentation. We have allowed time at the end to answer your questions. Please type them into the question box on the right and we will do our best to get to them all. This webinar is also being recorded, so it will be available to you after the call is over on stantech.com. We have a great panel of uh, speakers with us today who are going to share with you some ideas and best practices from around the globe that you can implement immediately in your town, your city, or on your next project. So uh, first of all, we have uh, Simon O'Byrne, who is both an award-winning urban designer, planner, and senior vice president of Stantex Community Development Business, based in Edmonton. As a city building expert, he has been frequently quoted in European and North American media and done many keynote talks on both continents. For the past seven years, Simon has been the co-chair of the Winter Cities Initiative and Urban Design Committee. Liza Cohen with Stantec in Boston is a multimodal planner who focuses on creating more and better transportation options. Liza has been working on quick build transportation projects in Massachusetts to help communities res rapidly respond to mobility needs in the face of COVID-19. And we have Andrew Manchel, who joins us from New York and is the author of Learning from Bryant Park, published by Rutgers University Press in April. For 10 years, Andy was Associate Director and Counsel at the Bryant Park Restoration Corporation and General Counsel and Director of Public Amenities to the Grand Central and 34th Street Partnerships. He has also practiced real estate law in New York City. Now he works for the City of New York, managing its $200 million technology franchise business. He has MBA and law degrees from New York University and a BA in government from Oberlin College. And you can see his blogs at the Placemaster com. So now I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Simon O'Byrne, who's going to get us started off with a safety moment. Thank you very much, Shauna. Uh, my safety moment is about situational awareness. As we go into this uh, winter, we know that it's a darker time of the year, and we also know that due to COVID, many of us are living locally. We're living, working, playing, and studying much closer to our homes and walking in our communities and cycling through our communities. As such, I think it's more important than ever that we be spending more time thinking about safety and thinking about people that are in our community, whether we're driving through a community or we're walking through the community, that we're much more situationally aware of what's around us and taking stock, especially as we are not just dark, but also a time of the year that we're in some parts of North America already starting to see uh, black ice or snow on the road and things aren't as, uh, as uh, as dry as they once were in terms of vehicles ability to immediately stop so my safety moment is about situational awareness and being um being always taking in what's in around you i've been involved with winter city for the last seven or eight years and it's something that's become very important and i think even more important during covid cities have to adapt to winter and they have to be a lot more aware of what changes and interventions can be done to make their cities a lot more livable it's not just for cities, it's also for universities and development projects going forward. It's really incumbent on places to think about winter and to strategize about how these places can become better in all four seasons. One of the big things I, I love to think about and talk about is how do we make communities and streets and, and projects unbelievably successful? Um, in terms of urban vibrancy in January and what do we need to achieve that and if we can achieve urban vibrancy in January something is going to be that same area whether it's a street a park a, a project a community is going to be unbelievably successful in the summer when it requires very little effort for people that live in a winter climate to go outside so it's really about designing for 
vibrancy in January and knowing that that requires a lot more deliberate help and intervention and thought. And if we can do that well, then it'll do exceedingly well in the, in the other times of the year. In Edmonton, where I live, it's 53 degrees latitude. It's the largest northern city in, in Canada and in North America. And as such, one of the things we try to do is try to reposition ourselves and pivot and think, start to change the narrative uh, rather than hibernating for winter to say, how do we become the greatest northern city on the planet? What would it look like to become the greatest northern city on the planet? What would it mean in terms of the built form, our economy, our fashion, how we dress? Um, how we live, work, play, and study. It's, it's self-evident to, to us now, but when we started this process seven or eight years ago, little things like patios were illegal in October. We weren't able to do them then. We could only have them in the summer months. We presumed nobody was using our city parks in the middle of winter. When we went out and actually did a canvas, and we found that there was far more people using parks in the dead of winter. So then we said, well, we, we better make sure that the park's budget is for all four seasons and not just several seasons. We want to make sure that we're getting vibrancy and activity all the time. A lot of the work that we've done really kind of looked at what was happening globally. We adapted it to Edmonton, but we really cherry picked a lot of the best ideas from around the globe, whether it's in Japan or Mongolia, or it was in Europe or other parts of North America. We really kind of grabbed all the best ideas and then we've kind of put them together in, in a different um, packages of information. Some of them in a toolkit fashion, some of them um, on websites. If you go and Google uh, City of Edmonton Winter City, you'll be able to access all this information, whether it's videos on how we did it, whether it's things about urban design interventions that can be done. And we've taken a lot of these really good ideas and a lot of our clients have really benefited from these design uh, tools being implemented, whether it's to make their street a lot more resilient and sustainable for all four seasons or it's for a new development project as well. Winter design in a nutshell really comes down to a few things. Uh, first and foremost, that's absolutely paramount, is about uh, blocking the wind. Blocking the wind is the single most important thing that you can do in terms of winter city design. Because it's dark for six months of the year and it's not completely dark, but there's not that much sunshine during the dead of winter. So it's most important is to block the wind. If you block the wind, the space and the environment is gonna be a lot more comfortable and pleasing. So start with blocking the wind as much as you can. Try to put people in the sunlight, especially where patios are located, parks are located, and also doing things like the think about the color and the aesthetics and the materiality so that things bring comfort and delight in the middle of winter. Use lighting to attract and to draw people and to make it more interesting and to rethink infrastructure. One of the things with winter city design on, on wind is to do proper wind modeling. So not just look at a singular building by itself, but look at the cumulative effects of how all the different buildings work together. One of the things we've learned is that a lot of cities would require a wind study to be done, but that would be looked in in, in isolation by itself. What you need to do is actually model the wind accumulatively across a broader area and see how the buildings work with one another. Otherwise, you can also have the unintended consequence of designing a building so that it, isn't, it doesn't generate wind below that building, but what it does is redirect it to pedestrians on the other side of the street. You don't want to do that. So we want to model buildings um, accumulatively and together so that we can get better outcomes. One of the buildings that does this really well is the Aqua Tower in Chicago, which is one of the tallest buildings in the world. It's right on, uh, right beside Maggie Daly Park in Chicago and right beside Lake Michigan. It's also the tallest building in the world designed by a woman, a female architect. And this building was designed so that at the ground level, you don't feel the imp impacts of the wind. Likewise, you have to think about topography, landscaping, how those can be used to mitigate the wind, using coniferous trees more often because they help mute the wind as well, and to use interventions like loggias and canopies and using buildings that are designed much more like wedding cakes as opposed to just sheer curtain walls to go from top to bottom and, have, uh, and, and capture the wind and amplify it. We need to do the opposite. Likewise, we have to take better advantage of the amenities that we have within our communities. One of the things that a lot of cities have started to consider and started with places like Melbourne, Australia and Victoria, British Columbia, where they started looking at their alleys and their city center and they said, these are wonderful opportunities where we can put commerce, we can provide shorter linkages from A to B, and we can make these areas places that people can cut through, we can have art installations in them, we can have restaurants that are in them, people can be selling things. 
But in a winter context, it's really important that we take these spaces and we actually make them uh, safe corridors protected from the wind. This is really important and we don't just treat them as ugly utilitarian things, but rather we beautify them, make them safer, and even have commerce in them so that we can take this and turn it into an amenity as opposed to a detriment. These are the types of interventions that a lot of cities are starting to think about in order to make it more comfortable to be outside, especially knowing that a lot of our main streets, a lot of our big um, classic uh, high streets in most of North America are designed to be quite wide from facade to facade. And because they're so wide, uh, there's a huge corridor for wind and sometimes the wind gets amplified in them. So providing uh, small, narrow alleyways becomes proper refuge for people, whether they're cycling or walking. Other things you can do is to do sunlight shadow uh, modeling and making sure that where we are wanting to cluster people the most, that we're putting them where the sun is and where there's the least amount of shade. And we're thinking about that as we're doing placemaking. Likewise, we have to embrace a different color palette. If, I think when we think of Scandinavian co uh, countries, we're often thinking about the type of colors that you see here on the on the screen. Well, it, it's shocking to me how often I see a materiality that reinforces cold in the dead of winter, as opposed to having some fun with color and, and making spaces much more interesting. Likewise, human beings are like a moss driven to a flame, that if you provide nightscaping and you do whimsical fun things and take the palette of darkness, which is winter, and you take these things and you create them, at you, whether, it's a, a, whether it's a blank wall or it's something else, that we kind of take these different spaces and we try to use architectural lighting and landscape lighting so that buildings and places become much more magical and charming and that buildings that have blank facades can become places where we can do art installations that are gonna attract people. That we also think about how these spaces are gonna be um, in January and are gonna be and are going to be able to draw people by having something a lot more interesting. Winter infrastructure is also really critical. And one of the things we found at Edmonton is that we didn't think enough about this. So how does our infrastructure perform, um, not just in the, in the middle of summer and thinking about store, uh, big you know, rainfall events and how we're going to do stormwater management, but how do we think about our infrastructure in terms of making it a lot more comfortable and appealing in all, in all four seasons? One of them is winter cycling. So one of the big things we've learned through winter cycling is that in places that get lots of snow, there's often salt or grit um, or, or, or surfaces are covered with snow. So it's not just, it's not good enough any longer to simply just throw down some green paint, green paint and say, that's a cycling lane. You must segregate the cyclists from the vehicles. Otherwise, the only people that will be cycling in the middle of winter are the lycra crowd. We need to segregate the spaces through Jersey barriers, through planters, through bollards, through other interventions so that these places can become safe. So that whether you're eight years old or 80 years old, you'd be comfortable in that space and feel safe in that space. Um, especially when you think about how often um, if, if that surface area is not cleaned out, your bike might slip out from underneath you. If you really want to get people cycling year round and keep this momentum that started in the spring with COVID going in terms of cycling culture booming, we must make sure that there's appropriate safety systems in place by way of segregation of these two uses. Likewise, we have to think about how does drainage work? We're seeing a lot more seesaws in terms of with climate change, in terms of freeze-thaw cycles. So even in the middle of winter, well, it could warm up substantially and it'll get cold and snowy again. But what happens is our catch basins get cluttered with ice and debris that falls. As a result, there's big pools of ugly brown water around these intersections. And what we need to do is to make sure that we have larger catch basins that are gonna drain much easier in the middle of winter. We have raised crosswalks, we use bulb outs, we make it a lot easier for people to get around these areas. My father, who passed away a couple of years ago, had a walker for the last couple of years of his life. And I can tell you, when we don't design infrastructure for all four seasons and only for the summer, it can be horrible for people like my dad uh, to get around in a walker. And it's even worse if you're in a wheelchair. You can get cut in the snow or have no choice but to go through these ugly brown pools of water. Likewise, in terms of building materials, we have to think about using wood and using the type of glazing that's gonna create transparency between what's happening on the inside of the building and the outside of the building. We have to do things that are gonna reinform reinforce warmth as opposed to make us feeling cooler. Likewise, we have to embrace loggias. Loggias are a building tool that was first done 2,000 years ago in order to protect people from 
the, the, the sun where it was too hot or provide protection for people from rain, but we also need to provide them in some locations as well um, in order to make sure that people are protected from falling snow and ice and sleet. Some of them could include uh, electric heaters to make them uh, more comfortable as well. And where we can't do that, we need to use awnings and canopies that are going to redirect the wind away from people and make it also uh, safe from snow, uh, falling snow and ice as well. Building entrances have to be different. What's shocking to me is that there's buildings that have been designed by star architects where they didn't think about how it was going to perform year round. One of the ones was a star architect that is very well known, designed a popular building on the MIT campus. But in the wintertime, three quarters of the entrances of the building had to be closed because of falling ice problems. We need to be thinking when we're designing buildings about how are they performing year round, how snow and ice going to work, um, aesthetically, how is it going to look? Is it a, in a, a type of materiality that's going to appeal to us in the dead of winter as much as it is in the summer? And we need to be also thinking about where's what's the orientation of the wind? So if we know the wind is is disproportionately goes because the jet stream from west to east and the coldest winds are from the north in North America, then you have to design buildings as much as possible so that the buildings are putting their back to the wind. In many cases, this is to the northwest. And that the open spaces where we're locating patios and plazas are really on the, the south side of the buildings. And if we can, making them sometimes even sunken so that they're further protected and sheltered from the wind. That way they can become four season public gathering places and can encourage um, year round usage. We also wanna have better transparency between the inside and outside of buildings. And one of the things I noticed when I was in Paris a couple of years ago, I was there for a horrible cold snap where it was zero Fahrenheit, seven, minus 17 Celsius. And I was surprised that the patios were still full. And what they did was you, you went to the restaurant, you sat outside on the patio, you sat on faux fur, they gave you a blanket, but in COVID times, it needs to be a BYOB culture where you bring your own blanket. But in this case in, in Paris, you'd be given a blanket, you put on your lap, you'd sit outside, keep your, your jacket and your, your hat and your, um, and your scarf and gloves on. And what you would do is there'd be simply a plastic curtain that was drawn around uh, the patio to make sure that it, mute, that it muted uh, not all the wind, but enough of the wind that would be comfortable. We can do this so that we can still have interventions that block the wind. In some cases, it might be a plastic curtain. It's, it might be simply just figuring out what is the most dominant wind and then putting some type of barrier there, whether it's, whether it's made out of wood or it's planters with trees that are close together. Other things that can be done are looking to famous ski resorts, whether it's Whistler or, or Mount Tremblant in, Tremblant in uh, Quebec, or it's uh, Vail or Aspen. Look at the type of materiality for a, a space that is designed for winter, the type of form they have, the type of building materials. These are materialities that bring charm and delight to a space that make us feel much warmer in the middle of winter. We have to take from those lessons and apply them elsewhere. Likewise, we need to provide better places for people to sit, sit and have awareness about how does the snow accumulate in that res respective city? Are we gonna have a park bench that's not gonna be comfortable enough? Can we do things like that that are gonna make it much, more, that are gonna be much more uh, comfortable? Can we also uh, provide places for snow storage by having boulevard trees? Can we also think about transit shelters in the winter climate much more earnestly than we do today? Transit shelters are absolutely critical we can't expect people in a winter climate to be using transit if we don't provide places for them to be out of the wind, out of cars that could be splashing um, as well. And again, I already spoke about the darkness. One of the key things with the darkness is embracing wayfinding that incorporates light. We can't ask, ask people to find and navigate their way around spaces if we don't provide a way for them to move through spaces by, um, by illuminating it and being aware of uh, how it's going to perform in the middle of winter. Likewise, we have to provide shelters and places of refuge for people. Winnipeg's famous for having an international design competition every year, and, and Toronto does the same with the beaches, where architectural design firms around the world come up with these shelters and these warming huts where people can hang around on the beaches in Toronto or on the Red River in Winnipeg, and they can go in there, and some of them have got fires, some of them are just protected from the wind, uh, they're all very interesting, uh, the ones that are that are chosen and, and win the design awards. We need to be able to put these in our in our public places, in our parks, so they can be a lot more comfortable for people. And we also have to use um, 
a different type of uh, landscape aesthetic as well in terms of the light landscape architecture that we're employing in our spaces as well. The materiality, how are we, how are these plants going to perform in the middle of winter? Are we using ornamental grasses that are going to stay year round? Bushes that still have colors in the middle of uh, winter. Are we also using coniferous trees more often, in particular where it can block the wind and, and shelter us more? Are we thinking about how that space is going to be just for July or are we thinking about it for January? A lot of it really comes down to all season buildings and spaces and thinking about them for all four seasons. And that's really the philosophy that we want to uh, we want to encourage you to think about. And lastly here, winter patios are really critical. And a lot of cities have already started to pull up their um, parklets and so forth. I think we have to keep our parklets. We have to make sure our local businesses can stay alive. And we need to be able to think about snow storage differently. We need to move the snow where it can go um, and, and uh, get it away so the parklets can stay open. We need to encourage broader uh, use of winter patios. We have to make sure that they're legal. We have to use heaters, whether they're propane or they're electric heaters that could be run on renewable energy. We have to be doing these kind of interventions to make sure that our local businesses can stay alive, particularly during COVID. And we have to have, have Fun. We have to create domes and structures like Paris has done where they had a design competition to come up with the best outdoor structures for the middle of winter um, that restaurants and businesses could use. We need to be able to think about that, especially even more so now during COVID. And, we, and fire is something that always draws in and attracts people. We need to use more of it and we need to provide um, it as a vehicle to attract and retain people. Winnipeg recently installed a whole bunch of movable and Aranda and Aranda and Aranda chairs and uh, fire pits that can be moved around in a strong Edison uh, uh, stringer lights across the space and it's become this unbelievably charming space and you can book a time slot in there for an hour or two and sit around and other people can do the same so we need to be able to do these interventions um, not just during COVID but in, in perpetuity to make sure that we we think about how spaces can be better used a lot of this ultimately is about winter life and constantly having a winter perspective on things, how our transit systems function, how we dress. So dressing to be outside uh, for hours, not just minutes, and, and, and to think about how winter life can be better. How do we design it better for children? Because the, if the children are happy, the parents are happy, and they're going to loiter and spend more time and space. So we need to think about how do we make these spaces much more sticky and inclusive of children. We need to keep the snow and allow kids, in some cases, to be able to take the snow and use them to turn them into slides and forts and other things, and then city workers mash up the snow, and it could be reused again for children. And the final thing I want to say is that this isn't always about spending a huge amount of money. There's a mayor in Brazil who famously said, if I want innovation and creativity, I take a zero off the budget. And one of the things that, that I love about this example from Germany is that they had an ugly underpass that nobody used. People felt very unsafe to go underneath it. It was really ugly. It had nothing going for it. And they had an international design competition to say, how can we reimagine the space? But the person that won it came up with the idea of doing something really incredible, which was to repaint it as a Lego bridge. Um, so for $1,000 worth of paint, they created a bridge that now has millions of tourists from around the world go to see and photograph themselves beside this, this bridge. And it's become one of the most popular kind of Instagram pictures to take in Germany is to be seen beside this Lego bridge. My point is that design excellence is really about bright ideas and it's not just about spending a huge amount of money. Over to you, Liza. Great. So hello, everyone. Um, I want to tack on to what Simon was talking about to talk specifically about transportation, mobility and keeping our cities going in these winter months and particularly these winter months with the added fun bonus of dealing with a global pandemic. So. I'm going to use uh, some examples from around Massachusetts of some quick build projects that we've worked with communities or we've contributed to uh, that various communities have implemented um, in order to keep things moving in the face of COVID um, and also some thoughts about how to do that as we prepare for winter, which is happening right now. Um, so we've worked on several of these projects that were just paint and bollards and creating more space for people to be outside, to bike, to walk. Um, 
several of these projects were specifically designed to be implemented as quickly as possible. So this is a rail trail conversion in Middleton, Massachusetts that was designed to go down over the course of about a week. And you can see some of the new users already on the right hand side, able to be outside and socially distanced. Um, of course, there have been several parklets and outdoor dining spots. And I want to point out that these are not, you know, the, the ready-made parklets that you sometimes see. These are built with jersey barriers, with cones, um, even constructed from uh, plywood with folding chairs. So again, things that can be built really quickly. But it wasn't just about outdoor dining, of course, and um, a lot of keeping cities moving is about making more space for people to be able to access transit and to be on transit. So this is a dedicated bus lane in Everett, Massachusetts. Um, MBTA has increased service on this particular line and now you know the, the buses don't get caught in traffic, which also allows there to be fewer people on more buses and increased space for distancing on those buses. The most important thing about all of these projects is that they're all able to be done relatively quickly with materials that cities and towns can either procure quickly or like the cones on the top right already have on hand. So the question is, what happens to all of these when it gets colder outside? Um, and the thing to remember is that there are a lot of people in the Boston region and of course in all of your cities and towns who live without a car, regularly travel without a car, some by choice and some who, you know, that would be just an expense they could never afford. Um, so looking at commutes into Boston, which is the graph on the right, you can see that there are you know, more than 300,000 people who travel into Boston each day by driving, but close to 300,000 people who take transit into Boston. And if all of those people were to suddenly switch to driving, our uh, already legendary traffic patterns here in Boston wouldn't get any better. So um, both of those things are important things to consider. And when we look at our local transit lines, you can really see that people are relying on these. So this, um, each line on this chart represents a different transit line in Boston. And the blue line you can see is actually ridership is coming back much more quickly than several of the other lines, which indicates that there are a lot of essential workers and people for whom that transit service is really essential on that line. So the question is, how do you plan for those people to still be able to be on transit even when it's cold and dark and snowy? A final thought is, interesting data point that I saw recently is that trips are getting shorter in the Boston region, which is an opportunity for us to plan for people to take those shorter trips by walking, by biking, and using transit. So preparing streets for winter, particularly now, um, means very quickly elevating how we plan for other modes in snow, when it's cold, and when it's dark. So we'll take snow first. Uh, snow does a really good job of highlighting where our priorities are. So I really like this photo of the driveway in the foreground that's completely cleared for trucks. There are no trucks. The street that's plowed for cars who are not out there driving. And then the unplowed bus stop with this massive line of people who have to wait in the street for their bus. So planning for snow is sort of like planning for any other sort of special event uh, we always recommend that communities create a plan you know what are you going to do with the excess snow um, how are you going to plow and a specific example from the boston region is cambridge where they're very transparent about what they do and do not plow but that includes key destinations like schools like public buildings and like high ridership bus stops and there that means that they have some uh, pedestrian scale snow clearance machinery and they're able to go out and plow some of these key locations and they're just transparent about what they're able to do. Um, we're working with another community, Salem, Massachusetts right now to be able to use um, PBD, which is a parking benefit district, so reinvesting parking dollars to be able to do just that because they've realized that this is an, a priority for them. One fun thing, snow has some advantages. So this image isn't from Boston, it's from Philadelphia, but I really love it. Um, I'm sure you all, well, some of you have probably heard of snack downs, snow neck downs, but snow reveals space on our streets that is unused by cars. And so here in Philadelphia, they took this triangle and actually converted it to more space for people and created a safer crossing. With cold, I think that the, it begs the question of who's bearing the brunt of the cold. So this is my favorite thing to complain about in the Boston region, um, which is at Logan Airport, 
there is a heat lamp above the line for taxis and nothing of the sort above the place where you wait for the buses. Um, and so in asking who bears the brunt of the weather, you have to think about people who are waiting at transit stops and trying to create stops that are more comfortable for those people and again, doing that quickly. So first of all, you can plan for larger stops that can account for any space reductions due to snow and plowing needs. Um, but second of all, this is a really great example from Everett again, where they installed this um, quick build level boarding platform and they've actually just put stickers on the ground to show where people can wait in a socially distanced way, which has been shown to uh, direct people that, you know, when there's lines on the ground, people tend to follow them. Um, but also implementing things like this board in the middle of the screen, which is a uh, solar powered real time arrival board, actually from Pittsburgh in this case. But um, when you tell riders when the next bus is coming, that has also been related to perceived a perceived decrease in wait times. Um, so, you know, quick things to help make transit riders more comfortable. Um, again, when it's cold, thinking about reducing perceived travel times between A and B. So this is a street in the city of Somerville where they just used planters and water filled barriers and cones and paint to create a accessible path along this street where before there was actually no way to traverse this street, but also to protect, protect people walking from people driving alongside them. And then finally, planning for mobility in the dark. So um, a couple of communities that we've worked with have implemented this pedestrian scale lighting instead of just relying on street lights and kind of ambient light from things along the side of the street. And what's nice about this is it does require a foundation, um, but these are solar lights, so they don't require expensive excavation or anything like that, and they can be implemented relatively quickly. Another thing to think about when it's cold and when it's dark is creating direct connections from A to B. So taking uh, taking advantage of alleys or connections through parking lots and really being intentional about signing and lighting and painting those for people to feel safe using them because as this example shows in the top left if you have a 500 foot block that might seem really long but you've got an alley that cuts right through it that shows a shorter distance from A to B. And then finally, uh, focusing on intersections is crucial for people walking. So I love this example on the top left. They just use these kind of decorative hay bales and planters to create little bump outs, but those automatically create more safe space for people to get out <clears throat> a little bit more into the street and be more visible to people driving and turning, um, as well as this roundabout on the top right, which is just cones and a little sign. Um, but it slows the traffic on the street. In this particular street, I believe they found that the speeds went down by about 5%. Um, but more importantly, opens up the road for new users to feel safe using it, like this guy on the skateboard. The final thing, though, for all of these interventions is to really think about where in your community people absolutely need to go. So this quote on the right is actually from Oakland. Uh, but I really liked it because Oakland did, you know, miles and miles of closing off residential streets and trying to create space for people to be outside in a socially distanced manner. And when they started talking to people, they found that people weren't actually that satisfied with the program. And when they dug a bit deeper, they found that people thought it was a great program, but it needed to be more focused on people getting to their essential places. So health clinics, schools, grocery stores, food distribution sites. So all of these quick build tools are great, but it's important to apply them where it matters. With that, I will turn it over to Andy. Thank you. Um, and and uh, I want to thank Stantec for asking me to join. Um, do, is my camera on, guys? No, it's not, Andy. OK, there we go. Now yeah, we're, we now we're, now we're over. OK. Um, so I, I wanted to thank Stantec for inviting me to do this. And, and as you can hear, um, Liza and, and Simon are really thought leaders in the field. They've been they've very creative about um, thinking about how to deal with winter. And um, I was asked to do this because I've recently written a book called Learning from Bryant Park, um, which draws on my experience working in Midtown Manhattan and in the, um, the neighborhood of Jamaica, Queens and other places. And um, I wrote the book because there were so many unsuccessful projects around. I was looking around at public space revitalization project and trying to figure out why there weren't more better ones. And the reason is that it's about ideas. And the reason is that the ideas are um, 
either unconventional or counterintuitive. So I wanted to lay out what some of those are. And I wanted to encourage, um, especially people in an audience like this one of clients, municipalities, developers, um, to uh, think creatively, kind of throw the rule book out, um, allow the right thing to happen. This is, uh, this is actually Bryant Park in the winter. Um, and, and it's going to be more challenging this winter than ever. This is a crucial period now um, with COVID ramping up, with a dark time, with economies um, at, at, at best flat to down, um, to really get creative, to think about how to animate public spaces, to get people to come downtown, um, to spend money, to want to be in their offices. Uh, this is the Winter Village in Bryant Park in the middle of Midtown Manhattan, once a desolate, forbidding place, and now the uh, pretty much the town square of New York City. Um, and I, I want to talk to you first about ideas and then give you some examples. But what this is really about is about placemaking. It's about thinking about how to make great places and particularly um, focusing not on the capital side of things, but on the maintenance of programming side of things. It's very important. It's not expensive, but you have to not have enough money available to do this. And it has to be focused in a particular place. Um, you can't do projects in 20 different locations downtown. You've got to pick one or 200 percent corners and focus on those, revitalize those, energize those, and then allow um, the activity to expand out. It's very, very important to think creatively. Um, to try and do new things and, and to be accepting of risk. Um, but the way to, to deal with risk is to moderate it. It's to not take huge risks, take little risks. And when you fail, then to self-correct. And, and iteration is the key to great placemaking and to great economic development in downtowns. And for example, with respect to retailing outdoors over this winter, um, there's more that we don't know that we do, and we're gonna have to try things. And then um, if they don't work, try something else. And, you know, the, this is about having an open mind. Uh, getting this to work is to go for those crazy ideas, to um, tr try and do something that you hadn't done before in the past. A lot of this is going to be new to us. Um, and I attribute a lot of my success of the work that we did in Bryant Park to the fact that um, when people came to us with ideas, we said yes to everything. We turned very few people things down. Um, and, and things that were bad, we didn't do them a second time. But we were open-minded. We did, we, you know, uh, public space managers very often get to be proprietary about their spaces and tend to um, want to keep people out of them or to um, demand insurance or indemnities. Um, and you, you don't want to keep people from working in your space. You want to encourage them to work in your space. So what are the biggest big things that make changes in public spaces that this winter we ought to be thinking about? And Simon laid most of them out, but I'm going to uh, reiterate some of the better ones. Um, our, our mentor, Holly White, William H. White, the author, author of um, the, the um, Sociology of Small Urban Spaces, uh, Social Life of Small Urban Spaces, talked about the importance of seating and chairs. Um, it, they're just nothing beats a chair to get people to sit in public spaces. This one even encourages them more with heaters. This, of course, is uh, Paris. Um, and Holly said, you know, the problem with sitting down, getting people to sit in New York is there weren't any places to sit. And and the conventional wisdom about movable chairs is that they get stolen or the homeless people use them. I don't know where people get that because the actually the data is that it's not true. Um, in our experience of moving uh, uh, movable chairs, movable chairs all over the country, in fact, all over Europe and North America has been unusually successful. Very few of them disappear. Um, and if the pro space is programmed properly, um, it gets the right uses. This is a temporary structure for dining. Um, New York has had a huge success recently with its open streets, open dining program. Um, the reason for the success is, again, they threw the rule book out. They made it very simple to go online and register and to, and to put something up. They made the rules pretty flexible about what to put up. And streets all over the city have been animated um, in late summer and fall uh, with, with dining establishments. And we're working now to make that work in the winter. The restaurant around the corner for me on Broadway uh, called Cafe de Soleil, which you might want to check out, um, has done bubbles. They've done um, kind of a shack like this. They have space eaters of various kinds. The other last Thursday I went to New York when it was raining really hard. I went to do pickup there and all the tables were full. I was shocked and people were sitting under the awning, in the bubbles, in the shelter in extreme thunderstorms. So 
Um, people really want to be outside. And, and up until recently, space heaters were illegal in New York City. Um, and with the fire department, thank goodness, has been somewhat flexible on this. And you can use propane space heaters and electric space heaters. It's more about the, the as Hyman noted, it's more about the sense of warmth and cutting the uh, wind than it is about the actual war warmth radiated by these things. People, um, cold is very much a psychological thing. And skating, if there's a silver bullet to winter, skating is it. Um, and the technology has changed. This is Bryant Park. Um, where we couldn't really figure out how to put a, a skating rink on top of an, um, an underground stack sculpture uh, structure for the library, which you see in the background. Um, the technology changed. We could load down a, throw down a, a fairly thin sheet of ice for people to skate on. Skate on. This skating is free. Um, again, we've got to think about social distances this, this winter and how we do that. But as uh, Dr. Fauci says in the New York Times tomorrow, um, you know, it's not a binary situation. It's it. You, we've got to um, figure out what the percentages are and do what's safe and co combine things that are safe. Um, this is a similar facility in Detroit, Campus Martius in Detroit. Um, and the lesson from Campus Martius, which was in a completely desolate place in Detroit, which is now a place that people come to from all over, um, is the the, the, the people who uh, created Campus Marshes came to Bryant Park with notebooks. They took notes. They went back to Detroit. They took all of the good ideas from Bryant Park and they just did them there. Um, and they've done a few of their own. But there's no there's no harm in, in copying what's been done in other, somewhere else. And Campus Marshes is a great example of that. A totally fabulous success. Um, skating in cities that have natural lakes and uh, uh, rivers is, of course, uh, particularly attractive. Um, this is the Twin Cities where they've not only done skating at night, but they've used lights creatively to attract people to the to skating. And this is really a, a new concept, and this is good, very hard. This is and this is going to be a lot having to do with retail this winter, which is leveraging empty spaces. Um, this is a picture of a, what was an empty storefront that we turned into artist studios and galleries, and it spontaneously generated activity, especially at night. Um, the prior slide showed a fashion show that um, some of the artists put together. Um, artists, the artists were nocturnal, so it was lit up at night. But in these empty spaces, we've got to think about being creative and flexible. Um, think about be flexible about what spaces we use, parking lots, cemeteries, make, you know, bringing light to these spaces at, at the very um, minimum, but also improving window displays for retailers. Um, this was an empty space in a cemetery. Uh, it was a chapel in Jamaica, Queens um, that we restored and we gave the keys to various arts groups and said, have at it, be there whenever you want, we'll pay for the insurance. And this, what was a, a, a derelict empty space in a, in a cemetery became very, very active in, uh, very quickly. It was a, one of the great ideas. Something again, on this space, this slide does not show social distancing, but this is the Queens Night, night Market of a couple of years ago. Um, the Queens Night Market was kind of a pop-up that drew 35,000 people to its second night. Um, it fostered local entrepreneurship. Uh, a lot of the people who uh, had the spaces were um, recent immigrants. So this is, landlords have to think both inside and outside with markets, which have been hugely successful in recent years, about how to be flexible with space, renting smaller spaces, uh, renting for shorter periods of time, uh, asking for less capital investment. Um, all of those things are important. And markets seem to have, we're in, in an era where, um, the, the retail market is shifting drastically and there are fewer and fewer will, people willing to take ground floor retail space. The places that are doing markets um, tend to have lists, waiting lists of, of potential tenants. Um, take a look at turnstiles in a subway station at 59th Street in Columbus um, Circle in New York City, which is a, was a, a tunnel in a subway system that's turned into a really hip um, uh, active uh, market that's extremely well designed, well thought out, um, to take a look at that as an example. This is the Nuremberg Night Market, which is the kind of the mother of all um, outdoor night markets that's done um, at, in December in Nuremberg. This, uh, this winter, we can't quit on January 1st. We've got to keep these things going to the beginning of March. We've got to keep our public spaces light and active all winter long. Uh, lighting has advanced hugely in the last 25 years, the technology has gotten much more um, sophisticated and inexpensive. The first lighting project I did, um, which I'll show you in a second, cost two and a half million dollars. The, you know, we did a similar project 
10 years later and it costs uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, this is Caldwell, Idaho, that has a kind of low-tech light festival that I recommend to you look at online. They do all kinds of creative stuff with very minimal stuff you can buy at the local hardware store. Um, this is the first lighting project I was involved in, which was the lighting of the facade of Grand Central Terminal, Midtown Manhattan. It had a huge impact on this very dark, dreary part of Manhattan. Um, we took the same ideas and we used them in Bryant Park. This is the moonlighting of Bryant Park, which was done from a, a building top. Um, lighting was a key component of the success of Bryant Park. We used metal halide rather than sodium vapor lights. We used light everywhere. It was carefully designed by theatrical lighting designers. Um, lighting is the most key component for getting through this winter, I would say. This is a, a dark, dreary underpass that we lit. Um, this, the, the, uh, where the restaurant was, was a um, storage facility that we turned into a restaurant. We lit the exterior. Um, we worked with a great architect, great lighting designers. Um, this really changed Midtown Manhattan. And this is my best, my favorite example of great lighting. You can see the um, URL in the lower left-hand corner. Um, this is a 12th century a bar relief on a church in a town called Conque, France. It was originally polychrome. Uh, the, over the centuries, the, the paint was uh, decayed. Uh, now it is uh, it's sandstone colored. Um, but this, the commune of Conque uh, did architectural research or archaeological research on the paints fragments that were left, and they created an LED-based light show um, that recreated the um, the color. Uh, as it was in the 12th century. Um, it's spectacular. It's become a big tourist attraction. Um, just for those of you watching, the right-hand side is, um, this is a last judgment. The right-hand side is um, the punishment and the, the left-hand side is heaven. Um, the right-hand side is much more interesting. If you look carefully, the, the, the punishments have been meted out to meet the crimes. Um, a lot of them are pretty gruesome and great. So uh, this is the Cour Mirabeau in, in Aix-en-Provence, France, which I regard as the most magnificent shopping street in the world. It has wide sidewalks. It has um, great eating all along, even in front of the retail stores. People put the chairs and tables everywhere, and they've creatively lit it um, during the winter months. And it's not just that it's the south of France. It's that it's well thought out, well designed space, although not well designed by planning, well designed um, as, a, as a matter of recreation over, over hundreds of years. Um, but take a look at what they do there. It is a great example of a great shopping street. Now we do have some time left for questions and there are some questions that have come in. Um, so I'm going to um, just go through a couple of them here and uh, direct them over to, to our panelists as, uh, as appropriate. So first one uh, is for Simon, I think. Um, just a question about any ideas on how to use winter design when redeveloping a downtown mall like Edmonton city center, but I think this would probably apply to any mall in any city. Um, yeah, um, and the first question is also about the winter beard, the winter beard's coming. Um, I, you, I start my winter beard the first time it gets to minus 20, which is, which is about uh, minus five Fahrenheit, uh, minus 20, then uh, once it gets that cold, including the overnight low, then I start my winter fuzz. Um, on the more important question about uh, downtown malls, I think um, a lot, almost most cities have got some semblance of a downtown mall. I think part of it is making sure that uh, the malls are thought about in terms of uh, ground floor, uh, not just kind of redirecting everyone into the skyways and the plus 15 pedestrian systems, but also that there's ground floor activity. Um, but to encourage ground floor activity, we have to make it easier for people to cross streets so that they don't have to stick in the pedway systems. Uh, we also have to, um, so we have to think about how intersections around the perform. We have to have awnings and other things that are going to make it much more comfortable for people to be in these areas. Uh, encourage loitering by way of um, much more comfortable, pleasing, delightful places for people to sit, like Andy was talking about. And we have to make sure that they're um, not uh, monochromatic and kind of singular. A lot of the buildings really kind of look like um, a, a big um, spacecraft landed in the middle of the downtown. And what we really have to do as much as possible is, is bust up the facade. Um, and whether it's kind of a faux facade or real facades, we need to be able to kind of bust up the facades and make sure that they are aesthetically pleasing um, and not just as kind of 
complete large uh, block of, of uh, singular looking uh, building, but rather going to bust it up into something that's going to be a lot more aesthetically uh, appealing. And there's great examples of some that have, you know, replicated, um, you know, m multiple facades, whether it's Edwardian era facades or other things are going to, you know, chop them up accordingly. Um, okay, there's another question uh, sort of around the interactions between, um, I guess, the, the developers and um, in terms of, you know, the space on some of the interior walkways and, and making sure we've got people um, um, able to lease those spaces, kind of that fine balance. So uh, between developers and, um, and the tenants and the cities. Can you comment on that? Um, uh, there's also some comments too, but uh, part of it is is um, encouragement of that. And there's some examples that there's you're simply just missing an opportunity. You're leaving money on the table by not thinking about the that space being better utilized. So part of it is making sure that we're designing the buildings for adaptability and flexibility, so that they can be um, uh, multifaceted and repurposed for access onto those areas. Um, and then, um, and then, providing people with great examples of where it has worked. Um, I'd rather kind of do that than kind of necessarily always kind of force it. But in some cases, it has been regulated and forced. Um, for example, it's been done more in areas where they want to take better advantage, where a landlord, somebody who owns the building, has really wanted to do it in order to uh, maximize the rents um, and make sure that they're um, uh, the other the other. And the reason we have to really kind of think about these things differently is a lot of the commercial spaces that were created 100 years ago um, were designed with very deep bays. Well, we don't need these deep bays any longer because we don't have to have so much storage of uh, things that we're selling. We don't need to have a, a back of house area where there's a huge inventory. And because we don't, uh, a lot of businesses like selling clothes or appliances or whatever, uh, don't have to have a huge inventory at the back. That means that a lot of the commercial bays are far too big. Um, and so we have to we have to reimagine these spaces differently and we have to chop them up uh, into different uses. And so by taking advantage of alleys or, or side walkways, um, we can better utilize the space and people can increase the, the lease revenue that they're getting from that space by making it acceptable, uh, accessible. There's a there's an endless pool of entrepreneurs willing to go in spaces. The trouble is um, finding an affordable enough space for them to be able to go into. Um, th there's not a lack of entrepreneurs, it's just a lack of affordable space for them to go to. So we have to reimagine these spaces. And if we get enough critical mass of them, they become more successful than the landlord makes more money. One of my um, mantras, and I'm speaking here as a real estate lawyer, is it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I tend to be kind of eradicated with this stuff, which means, you know, if there's a space you can animate, you can think of a way to do it that's temporary, um, and you can't find the right person to ask, uh, then I, you know, fill the space, especially right now. I mean, given, given how much we need to animate spaces um, that it's very hard to argue that somebody sh you shouldn't be doing that. We've got quite a few more questions here, so I'm not sure we'll get to them all, but I'll just uh, read a couple more and um, we can always follow up with you or you can follow up with us um, after the fact if, uh, if we don't get to your questions. So um, uh, one of the questions here is around um, lighting as a uh, crucial element for the cold and dark has been mentioned and that experimentation is key um, and maybe anyone on the panel could just talk about um, your experience with creative lighting projects well i um I can, I can talk particularly about um Two things. One, one is um, hanging lights that you buy at the hardware store between lamp poles and, and trees, uh, and the other is using storefronts, making sure that storefronts in a downtown are are lit at night, and that uh, uh, hopefully people use open grating rather than roll down grating. Um, 
it, if, if people have rolled down grating, try to persuade them not to use it and to keep the lights on. Um, you know, bounce light from retail spaces is really important. Um, and I, I think the last thing I would say about that is also holiday lighting this year. Um, a lot of people have money for holiday lighting. They should try and be a little more creative, but they should also leave their holiday lighting up until the end of February. Um, there is no, uh, there is nothing in, in the, the United States Constitution, I think, or in the Canadian Constitution that says that all holiday lighting must be taken down by the first week in January. Yeah, I, uh, I just want to chime in. The example that I showed was actually funded by a grant for a transportation project. So they made the argument that lighting was crucial for mobility in their downtown. Um, and those lights were fabricated to fit in with kind of the historic New England vibe that they were going for in the downtown. So that was a, a great experience in both placemaking, but also thinking about how placemaking links to mobility and kind of this crucial need to get around. Uh, one of the things we've learned about uh, architectural lighting is that um, it, it it works best where there's uh, rich contrast. So you know, throwing up more light at Times Square doesn't really move the needle, um, but rather picking places that are actually dark or darker and then doing it there. So the 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 greater the contrast on that street or park or area between darkness and where you, where you're going to now do the illumination. Uh, the better and not to just kind of blanket it everywhere but to kind of really uh, pick your spot so that you you get the best uh, bang for your buck and and the, the greater the contrast the more visually interesting and stimulating it is we've done pilot projects uh, or when we when um, governments have given out grants uh, it's best to kind of start with the low hanging fruit which is architectural lighting and, and helping um, having provide uh, grant money to uh, owners of heritage buildings. Heritage buildings, you put some light at nighttime on a heritage building and on the cornice or other architectural details, and it just becomes magical. It's so charming. Um, so the more you can kind of focus on those buildings kind of first and then look at the interventions you can do where there's a blank facade or uh, a space that needs some kind of um, um, art or intervention that the next. Um, thank you very much. Uh, so we are pretty much at time. Um, I don't want to keep people any longer than we have to. We can answer a couple more questions if people want to stay. Um, um, but I think uh, probably going to start. Should we just do one or two? And we might lose some people, but do you want to just do one or two and then we can email back the rest maybe? Yeah, um, there's one question that kind of just came in here at the end around um, uh, the questions are um, around beautification of spaces like alleys. Great idea, but how to implement this with equity in mind? Um, I'm also thinking about issues related to gentrification as well. Liza, you want to start with that? Yeah, I think, I mean, from my perspective, it's it's thinking about where you spend your dollars. So not just activating alleys that might be close to, to restaurants and dining opportunities in a downtown, but um, activating those that go to places where people need to go. Um, so health centers, schools, uh, busy bus stops even. So it's really about kind of prioritizing uh, those things that are most important, particularly for people to just get their basic needs met. Uh, Andy, I've got some thoughts as well, but Andy, do you want to go for next? No, go, go ahead, Simon. Uh, just, um, I think that the big thing with gentrification um, is um, gentrification sometimes can be unavoidable in terms of the, when you look at it over a long-term perspective, how areas evolve and go through cycles where they, they trend up, they trend down, and so the, the market realities evolve over the generations. So I think that there's always going to be some measure of that, either we talk about gentrification, but we sometimes don't realize when the opposite happens and an area goes into into decline. And these are kind of can be natural cycles. I mean, governments can sometimes hinder them or enable them. Um, the other thing to be aware of when we're designing this uh, these places is that they don't become uh, designed for just one cohort. And I think one of the problems sometimes with placemaking is that um, is that they become antiseptic and boring and really. Um, very um, 
very and they and then they'll fail if they're just designed for one group. So if you're just saying we're just going to design it for a bunch of you know wealthy yuppies um, and you just get businesses catering to them, then it really becomes boring and and, and too predictable. And I think when we go to places, uh, the places that we love to go to the most are places that I describe as as having being best described as messy urbanism um, and or messy vibrancy. And so areas that have messy vibrancy are really designed for all age groups, different income groups, different racial groups. And it's not just about tribe designing for one, one group. The places that I think that are worthy of people's affection the most are really inclusionary and designed for everybody. So um, it's not just saying it, it's just about equity, but it's really about uh, designing something that everyone's gonna find something there. And so one of the examples maybe is kind of a segue is, one of my favorite parks in the world is the one that Andy was, Andy was very much involved with, which is Bryant Park. And the reason I love Bryant Park is you see everybody there. Um, it's not just, you know, Upper West Siders. It's it's all kinds of people from the tri-state area and tourists and other people that go to Bryant Park and love it. So um, because it says something for everyone, I think that's very important in terms of urban design and placemaking. Um, Andy, did you want to comment on that or no? Uh, I think Simon, uh, I, I, I think Simon uh, stated it well. And if I started talking about uh, placemaking and equity, um, that would be another hour. So, okay. Uh, another. Well, we'll do one one more question here, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, what do you think? Kind of for Simon, I guess. What do you think is the reason for outside farmers markets to close during winter in Edmonton, knowing that they will bring a lot of economic and social benefits? And I suppose that would apply beyond Edmonton. Um, well, I, it, one, one of the things that we were surprised to find out is that farmers markets in Moscow, and nobody thinks of Moscow as having a Mediterranean climate, but the farmers markets in Moscow are year round. So They'll be selling apples and oranges and, and onions in February, um, and they don't just do it from uh, spring to fall. And so one of the things we have to do is start thinking about our farmer's market. This is thing that if it's not comfortable to be in shorts, then somehow we shouldn't have a farmer's market. Um, we need to dress appropriately to be outside for hours. We need to make those sticky places, um, and we need to be able to have farmer's markets uh, year round. And sometimes it can be indoors, um, sometimes it can be outdoors, but they can also be designed with tents that have more more sheltering around them. But, um, you know, whether they're picking up on the Nuremberg night market or Christmas market that Andy was showing um, or the distillery park um, uh, night market that happens uh, for several months in Toronto, uh, there's some really good examples. But we need to be thinking about these marketplaces as being year round and not just for uh, not just for the, the the shoulder season, the shoulder season. They really, there's no reason they can't be in the middle of winter. In fact, if you, I think if you build it, they will come. Uh, people love farmers markets and they'll go to them. Um, and just maybe some of the things that are sold in them uh, changes. So it just maybe it just means different vendors, but there's always a lineup of people and entrepreneurs willing to sell something. It just might be different things at different times of the year, and that's perfectly good. Just like you wouldn't have, you know, somebody who's going to be selling um, asparagus. They really only need to have this stand for one month when the asparagus um, pops up in the spring um, and don't need to be there in the fall. Um, we need to think about, you know, swapping in and out vendors depending on the seasons um, and, uh, and, and simply not shut them down. And people will use them if you build them. Great. Thank you, Simon. Um, so I think... Uh... Sean, Sean, let me just add one. I want to urge people um, following up on what Simon said. Um, it, it's not a, it's it's not voluntary. You must keep your markets open this winter. You have to figure out how to do it. You have to, and you need to follow the science um, as the science gets more detailed. Um, the Council on the Environment, in New York City, runs the farmers markets here. Um, they have protocols. They're up on the website. Um, they, they've run farmers markets throughout the pandemic. So it is absolutely essential that we expand our markets beyond just uh, produce and then keep them open during the winter. End of evangelism. 
Thank you, Andy. I appreciate that. So uh, yes, we're definitely uh, over time and uh, have a lot of questions still that we did not get to, but we will um, we will record all of those and uh, we will respond. Um, just uh, I had a few questions of people asking if it, this recording will be available. It will be available on stantech.com. We will be posting the recording, uh, probably be uh, up in the next week or so. Uh, so so watch for that and. Um, Tell your friends about it if you uh, if you had others who wanted to to attend but couldn't attend today. So thank you very much on behalf of Stantec and and on behalf of our panelists. And I hope you all have a, a great and warm day. Thank you very much.